Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to call tonight's May 19th, 2016 City of Santa Barbara Harbor Commission meeting to order. Uh, Jeanette, would you call roll, please? Yes, Bill Spicer. Here. Corey Bantulin. Here. Betsy Kramer. <clears throat> Stephen McIntosh. Here. And Jim Sloan will be absent tonight. Very good. Uh, Mr. Reedman, any changes to tonight's agenda? Yes, Mr. Chair, um, we'd like to take item 10, the Harbor Operations Report, before item 9, the Facilities Management Report. Very good, so we'll switch we'll 8 and 9. Switch or uh, 9 and 10. 9 and 10. All right. And then I'll just remind the commission that we have quite a few lease items. We have like six lease items on the agenda tonight, but we put them on consent. So we'll just be doing them together with the minutes in uh, the interest of efficiency. Excellent, excellent. And I was gonna make a note of that as well. Um, but before that, we are at the point now where we uh, invite anybody for public comment on any topic that is not on tonight's agenda. Uh, we have a few people in the audience, but I didn't see any slips. So with that, I will open and close public comment. Um, and now we will move to the, the consent calendar. Uh, as Mr. Reedman mentioned, we're following um, protocol that uh, city council uses. So we've moved uh, a handful of topics together and uh, Jeanette will read those. We will combine them. We will uh, vote at the end. And if any commissioner feels it necessary to pull any of these topics out of the consent calendar, after Jeanette reads them, you have that opportunity before we vote. So with that, I believe it is Jeanette's show. Okay. <clears throat> Item one, approval of the minutes, recommendation that Harbor Commission waive further reading and approve the minutes from the regular meeting of March 17th, 2016. Item two, assignment of lease agreement number 24741 Shoreline Beach Cafe, recommendation that Harbor Commission recommend to City Council Approval of the assignment of lease agreement number 24741 from Steve Marsh, Kevin Boss, and Beach Rock Inc., a California corporation, doing business as Shoreline Beach Cafe to Beach Rock Inc. for the 5,095 square foot restaurant located at 801 Shoreline Drive. Number three. Proposed lease agreement with Char West. Recommendation that Harbor Commission review and recommend City Council approve a, of a five-year lease agreement with one five-year option with John K. Williams, Inc., a California corporation, doing business as Char West at an average initial base rent of $4,231 per month for the 1,069 square foot space located at 221 Stearns Wharf. Item four, proposed lease agreement with Great Pacific Ice Cream. Recommendation that Harbor Commission re review and recommend City Council approval of a five-year lease agreement with one five-year option with John K. Williams, Inc., a California corporation doing, bu doing business as Great Pacific Ice Cream at an initial, average initial base rent of $4,053 per month for the 395 square foot restaurant located at 219 Stearns Wharf Suite A. Item five, proposed lease agreement with Old Wharf Trading Company. Recommendation that Harbor Commission review and recommend city council approval of a five-year lease agreement with one five-year option with Stearns Wharf Inc., a California corporation doing business as Old Wharf Trading Company at an average initial base rent of $13,278 per month for the 2,369 square foot space located at 217 Stearns Wharf Suites A, B, and D. Item six, proposed lease agreement with Dahlia and John Adams doing business as Madam Rosinka. Recommendation that Harbor Commission review and recommend city council approval of a five-year lease agreement with Dahlia and John Adams doing business as Madam Rosinka at an initial base rent of $797.30 per month for the 153 square foot space located at 221 Stearns Wharf Suite B. Item seven, five-year license agreement with Epic Cruises Inc. 
recommendation that Harbor Commission recommend to City Council approval of a five-year license agreement with Epic Cruises, Inc. for a water taxi service, shoreboat service, and limited charter service operating from Santa Barbara Harbor. Thank you, Ms. Prezinski. Um, Mr. Chair, if I may add, just yeah. um, tonight we have in the audience Steve Marsh and his wife Lisa from Shoreline, representing Shoreline Beach Cafe. So he will now be the sole owner of the of Shoreline Beach Cafe, assuming control of Beach Rock. And also we have um, Francisco Aguilera with this uh, in support of his two leases on the wharf, Char West and Great Pacific Ice Cream Company. So they're, both parties are here in support of their their lease agreements. Excellent, excellent. Are there any questions from the council on any of these? Yes, please. Can I ask a question on um, number four, or starting with number four? Please. So, Mr. Bossy, I'm guessing this is for you. Um, I'm just curious as to how we arrive at the square footage rates for all these businesses where um, Francisco is paying $10.26 a square foot, and we have others that are at 282 a square foot, and the others are somewhere between four and five. And I know these are all historical. They've had their evolution in different ways, but is there anything that allows us to compare these or normalize them down the road, or just what do you think about that? Mr. Chair, Commissioner McIntosh, um, we used to have in the leases a um, three-year adjustment where the base rent would be adjusted to 75% of the total rent paid during the previous three years, base plus percentage rent. And this was to when you had a, a tenant that was paying a, a percentage rent far in excess of the base rent, it was to bring them closer together so you wouldn't have the big disparity between the base rent you're getting at the beginning of the month and their percentage. In uh, uh, um, Great Pacific Ice Cream is a good example of that. They pay 15% of gross as their uh, percentage rent and do quite well out of a very small space. So that just the way it computes a high gross sales on a really tiny space, you end up with a really with a high per square foot um, figure like that. But it's irrelevant because he's, he's always in percentage rent on that lease. It's all about percentage rent and not um, per square foot. Okay, that helps. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? I would entertain a motion. So moved. Second. We have a first and a second. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any abstentions? Any nays? I think I can vote for everything but the minutes. Or may I vote for the minutes? You can approve the minutes, yes. You can vote on the minutes. Aye. Okay. Thank you. We now move to item number eight and the director's report, Mr. Reedman. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, commissioners. Um, in terms of council action, since we met last, the uh, council authorized me to submit an application to the uh, California Department of Resources Recycling and Re Recovery, I'll just call them Cal Recycle, um, for some household hazardous waste grants for which the city um, is eligible. And this is up to $50,000 in grant money for waste disposal, hazmat disposal, such as we uh, did at last weekend's swap meet where we brought in the hazmat uh, collection station in coordination with the, with the uh, swap meet. So that was one of the grants we received. Um, we had uh, two council budget work sessions in the last two weeks. Last Wednesday, all the managers uh, presented the fiscal year 2017 proposed budget to the full council. And then on Tuesday, uh, Brian and I attended the finance committee meeting, the council finance committee, and Brian did the uh, presentation on enterprise, specifically on enterprise fund, the waterfront enterprise fee changes. Um, there were no comments at the finance committee uh, regarding the waterfront fees. And these were the fee changes that were all approved or recommended by the Harbor Commission at the March 17th meeting of this year. Um, in late 2015 and early 2016, the grand jury, uh, the county civil grand jury, had a couple interviewed a couple of staff members who are sitting in front of you tonight. 
uh, regarding a number of issues, including county property taxes on boat slips, vessel operability requirements, liveaboard permits, and vessel DMV registration compliance. And there, there was just some confusion, and I, I assume the county civil grand jury received some complaints on why slip holders had to pay, in addition to the rent on their slips, a county tax. So um, that was clarified. Vessel operability requirements, we clarified what, how we check up on that. Live aboard permits, there was a feeling um, that there were many more live aboards than actually are signed up for live aboard permits. And we explained our policies on that. We have about 100 of them. But on any given weekend, people can come and spend a weekend on their boats. There are vacation um, exceptions where you can spend 60 days. 60 days a year on your boat. So not everybody who seems to be going back and forth every day is necessarily a full-time live aboard. Um, and finally, vessel DMV registration, we go through a once a year sweep or we try and catch up with everybody and make sure they've got their um, DMV current. And also we have quite a few boats in the harbor that aren't DMV registered at all, they're Coast Guard documented. So after clarifying all that, um, on April 19th, the grand jury released a report and found that the harbor is operating within its own regulations and policies and no report and, uh, and um, local policies. And the report was, uh, no re response was uh, required or requested by the grand jury. So open and shut. And on Harbor Commission vacancies, we have three vacancies on the commission. We've had seven applications. Um, the council interviewed two applicants this Tuesday, and additional uh, applicants will be interviewed on Tuesday, May 24th at 6 p.m. and Tuesday, June 14th at 2 p.m. So we have a pretty good field to choose from with seven applicants. Um, the new commissioners will be appointed by the council on June 28th and seated at the next or at the July 21st meeting of the commission. And we've got some real promising candidates. I've met a few of them in my office to explain to them about how uh, this all works. So tentative items for the June meeting, local coastal program, looks like it's been pushed back a ways, a lot of edits by the Coastal Commission and um, East Beach mooring program update. And with that, I'd conclude my report unless there are any uh, questions. Thank you, Mr. Reedman. Any questions? Uh, Commissioner Bantelin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say kudos to staff. When I first saw the grand jury report, I said, uh-oh, usually uh, I'm not sure I've seen a favorable one. And then they said everything's A-OK. -okay, you're doing a great job. So um, really good job on that. Thank Mr. you. Kramer. That's basically what I was going to say as well, but I was <laughs> saying it from a different perspective, having been on the grand jury at one point. And I thought congratulations to the staff for explaining and answering all their questions. Thank you very much. I, I would echo that, and I have recently been summoned as a grand juror or no, potential. Just, oh. It's a civil grand civil, jury. Civil, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. Congrats. So, uh, moving on to item, uh, we are now at the Harbor Operations Report. Oh, sure, council member. Uh, owners or bearers or occupiers can could you tell us what you feel about that well I personally think that having a um, diverse Commission is best but I might add, throw that over to Commissioner or um, mr. Reedman to uh, get his opinion on that um, do we have a we don't have a policy um, mr. chair council member Hotchkiss it gets difficult when we have a um, when we begin to near a majority on the, on the commission of, of slip permittees. And that is because whenever we're discussing slip fees or slip transfer fees or slip related matters, they're conflicted out. Yes, I can see. And so at one point, it was pretty difficult a couple of years ago when we had four members of the seven on the commission um, that were slip permittees. And so they, we couldn't, it gets difficult to have a, Get a vote. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, that's a, that's a good point. Thank you very much. I'll relate that to the council. 
Yes, I watched the interviews that, and the questions that were asked, and I think those are good questions. We just don't want to get too heavily weighted in one direction or the other. Excellent point. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate the comment. Mr. Croman. Mr. Chair and Commissioners, good evening. Well, I'm happy to say that we had a, a record turnout for Operation Clean Sweep on May 7th. Uh, as you may recall, we circled all the way back to Marina 4, where we began 10 years ago. So it's, it's kind of a good news, bad news story. The good news is we still found another ton and a half of junk. So the bad news is we still found another ton and a half of junk. So, um, you know, it was hard to tell whether it was new or old. The only, the only metric I could go by was how much marine growth was on it. And it appeared, if I had to take a stab at it, more of it was new than old. So hopefully the ongoing education as part of this is as much of a success as the event itself. But we had a terrific turnout. We had about 15 divers and 40 plus uh, dock volunteers, including uh, Commissioner Kramer was there. Uh, we removed bicycles, trash cans, dock carts, crab receivers, step ladders, tarps, a fiberglass skip, skiff, three toilets. Who throws toilets in the bay? Um, and one marine battery. But above, and all, above all that, I, w I really want to, on behalf of staff, thank all the volunteer corps for their spirited efforts. And this included folks who've come up, come every single year, and folks who came for the first time, liveaboards and what have you, um, dive companies like Salty Dog Dive Service. Monterey Diving came all the way. They've, every year they've been coming down for, all the way from Monterey, bringing two to four divers with them every time just because they're, their heart's in it, their spirit's in it, and they know it, it's good for the environment and good for the community. Scrub It Up Dive Services uh, was there again. They were all instrumental in locating the seafloor debris. And on dock side, we had volunteers from NOAA, Santa Barbara Surfrider, Channel Keeper, the Maritime Museum, local citizens and business contributing their energy and efforts to, uh, to this project. So I can't thank them enough. I have a few visuals for you. Not too many, I promise. Here's a skiff, 12-foot skiff we found uh, on the bottom sitting there. There they are rolling it off. Battens and boards and barbecues here in this one. One of the marine toilets that must have blown off the deck. What appears to be a shop vac and a trash can. This one looks like a, well, who knows? Wouldn't have taken 10 years to do that. And this, I'm not completely sure what it was. I thought I was when I put it in the slideshow, but now I'm not so sure. So uh, nondescript junk. And the, and the group shot. And, and, this is, and some of them had peeled off. They got their sandwich and they'd done their work and God bless them and they had peeled off. So this is probably, you know, maybe three quarters of the folks. But you can see what a, you can just tell by looking at this what an energetic, happy, engaged crowd it was. So it was, it was really a terrific event. And uh, we look forward to all of them joining us again next year as we revisit Marina 3, where last time 10 years ago, it will be 11 then, but 10 years ago for Marina 3, um, we picked up two tons of junk. So we would see what happens there next year. Back to the fisheries. We've been talking about rock crab fishery since last November when there was a, a full-on closure due to a, a domoic acid uh, bloom, which, in, of course, was a, a function of and related to algal blooms associated with El Nino. And uh, the state health officials have, have opened the entire coast, and they've opened all of the Channel Islands now except for one tricky little spot right there. And I say tricky little spot because this is a big percentage, a good portion of the crabs landed in Santa Barbara come from this area. It's two fish blocks, and it includes the east end of Santa Rosa Island, the west end of Santa Cruz Island, and spilling onto the north side of both islands, and, uh, excuse me, the south side of both islands and the north side of Santa Cruz. So not unrelated to this, the, uh, on April 28th, the state legislature's Joint Committee on Fisheries and Aquaculture convened a, a hearing on crab season and demoic acid lessons learned. And some of the items that were on the agenda and on the table for what I understand was a very vigorous discussion was, what are the protocols for testing? Why do you test, viscer why do you test the viscera and make your decisions on the viscera and not the meat? What are the protocols for opening a fishery? What are the protocol, or excuse me, what are the pro protocols for closing a fishery? What are the protocols for reopening it? And to hear it said, and, and as our, was articulated by the chair of the committee, 
Uh, some of these are, are not really crisp and out there kind of floating in the mist, if you will. And so uh, the chair of the committee uh, pretty sternly told the state representatives from Public Health and Environmental Health Services that they want to reconvene, I believe it's in, uh, in August or is it July? It's um, in, uh, I apologize. August. Thank you. They're going to reconvene in August and they expect the answers to these to be forthcoming from the state officials who are in charge of these uh, kind of openings, closures, protocols for testing, what have you because it's, it's cost uh, fishermen and related business a lot of money, notwithstanding the importance of public health, that's, that's duly noted and that's top priority. But uh, I think ironing out some of these sort of loose edges and making the, the program, the testing programs and the protocols more crisp will benefit everybody involved because there's been a lot of questioning about the frequency of tests and all that kind of stuff and it's gotten very complex and so I think this will help iron all that out. On a related note, I mentioned to you last month that there's a $138 million bill, um, a, a federal aid bill pending to help out not only people associated with this fishery, the fishermen and the, and the businesses, but even more important, and I apologize for you know, the word important, but in terms of dollars, it's the Dungeness crab fishery to the north of us where hundreds of millions of dollars literally have been lost between the fishery, the wholesalers, the retailers, the restaurants, et cetera, they're just now, just today, the Fish and Wildlife sent out a press release where they've opened up almost all of the new North Coast. It's very, very late in the season, and they're already looking. They're already worried about soft shell crabs, and crabs that are already molted out and ready to start the new season. So it's almost like opening the door when the entire season is closed. But notwithstanding all the moving parts uh, associated with that, this 138 million dollar appropriations bill, or bill that is in appropriations, would create a lot of direct aid, this isn't loans, as a direct grant assistance to the people and businesses associated with both our rock crab, rock crab fishery and the Dungeness uh, fishery to our north. And finally, uh, next week is our annual uh, nationwide uh, safe boating week. And what, this is, this is a, a really a, an educational week where the emphasis is on uh, safe boating just prior to the open, uh, you know, the wide open beginning, if you will, of, of boating season on ocean, on lakes, rivers, waterways, and what have you. And so they ro the state rolls out a big campaign. We've got, we've got uh, signs on the marina gates, to, you know, reminding people about some of the tips I'm going to mention right here so you and anybody watching is, uh, is aware of them, are aware of them. First and foremost, you know, 50 to 60 people die every year in boating accidents in California. And a, and a high percentage of those aren't wearing life jackets, and a high percentage of those, even if they are wearing life jackets, it, well, excuse me, the high percentage of the ones who aren't wearing life jackets are alcohol-induced as well. So number one, wear a life jacket. Find the right Coast Guard-approved life jacket. Make sure it's sized appropriately for you and people, people on your vessel. Don't put oversized life jackets on children. The worst that can happen is they end up in the water and the thing floats up around their neck and it can make a bad situation even worse. So that's a really important thing uh, to, to, uh, to take note of, okay? There's the fit and the Coast Guard uh, certification. Number two, don't drink and go boating. You know, it's just not a good idea. The effects of alcohol are compounded by sun and salt air and the, and the, and the energy it takes, you might not notice it, but the energy it takes just to keep your balance on a boat. By the end of the day, that compounded with alcohol can really mess up your uh, your reaction times and your and your uh, your sense of navigation and 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 when to stop and when to go and where you're going and all of that. So, drinking and boating just don't go together. And we would really encourage folks to have alcohol-free boating trips. Know your state's boating laws before you go. If you don't know them or folks don't know them, we have plenty of these at our office. It's the ABCs of California boating law. We have them to distribute. Just Come on by the Harbor Master's office. They're, they're free, and we got plenty of them, and when we run out, we know where to get more. There's no reason not to go boating with all the safety knowledge you, you need to have. Um, make sure you and your boat are prepared. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that if you need a safety check, you make sure you have all the right, you know, all the right safety gear, or if you want to make sure that uh, your, your, your boat and, and, and you uh, are prepared to take ocean voyages, you can get uh, boating lessons, for, excuse me, free safety vessel check, free safety, free vessel safety checks and boating safety classes from the Sail and Power Squadron or from the Coast Guard Auxiliary. 
So if you contact the, the, Cal, the uh, Santa Barbara Sail and Power Squadron or our branch of the Coast Guard Auxiliary, they'll provide free safety checks of your vessel. They'll also provide free boat safety lessons. And that's, that's pretty hard to beat if you're going to sea and you're not a, a really veteran seaman. Um, finally, check the weather. NOAA weather radio is almost in every VHF, marine VHF you can get these days. Uh, if you don't have one, you can get a portable, VA, a portable NOAA weather radio station, little box, little cube, or a small, uh, you know, uh, uh, NOAA radio, weather radio. And finally, file the float plan. You remember last year when we found the, the gentleman on Santa Cruz Island and we were able to escort him to the shore in time to get his kidney uh, transplant? That was because he had the basic of a float plan. He told his wife where he was going. So the key is tell your, tell your family or tell your friends where you're going and when you expect to be back. And if they're overdue, make sure somebody's your contact person to call the Coast Guard or your local, like Harbor Patrol, your local maritime uh, safety authorities. And that pretty, that pretty much wraps it up. It's a great time of year for these reminders, especially pe since people are getting ready to go to sea in droves. And uh, we hope po folks pay attention to these and, and look at the uh, signs on the marina gates and wear the right life jackets and don't drink and drive, et cetera, et cetera. So that concludes my report uh, this evening, Madam, Mr. Chair. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Cronman. Uh, any questions? Uh, well, uh, my congratulations and thank you for the clean sweep and the, uh, the, the continued support you bring and the goodwill it creates through the community. Thank you very much. Mr. Triberg, facility management report, please. Good evening, Chair Spicer and Commissioners. Our staff completed inspections of Stern's Wharf a couple of months ago. Our dive crew inspects the wharf from the mud line all the way up onto the deck and develops a bid package that we put out to bid uh, about a month and a half ago. It included the installation of 22 wooden piles, four splice piles. These are installed underneath buildings where you can't drive piles. Uh, installation of pile caps, stringers, and deck boards. And the work this year focused on um, Supporting the utilities that ran out to the out onto the wharf, and also uh, uh, the structural elements under in the surf zone. An example of how we support our utilities, as you can see, this is a eight-inch water line uh, provides uh, domestic water and fire water. The other side, we have a large sewer line, and the caps, which are the the large uh, beams coming out, are frequently cantilevered out with the utilities set on them. So this year, we focused on installing new piles to to provide additional support. So what you're seeing is a brand new pile right in front of you there, which is a lot better for supporting the, the, this critical utilities. Um, we did the, it's mostly on the east side of the wharf, and we have fire extinguish, or excuse me, fire hydrants out there, lamp posts, domestic water, fire water, the whole, uh, everything you can imagine running out there. So it's a, it's a significant structural upgrade. The area, other area we focused on was the surf zone, vents about 20 through 26. So this area takes a beating, as anybody can imagine, depending on the tide. And what you're looking at are um, 1980s technique for wrapping piles. I've talked a lot about wrapping piles that are not damaged completely, but damaged enough where they need some additional structural reinforcement. Those two concrete sleeves you see there were installed in the early 1980s, and they are still holding the piles together, but it's impossible to inspect them. So we've drive new piles kind of in the vicinity just to add an additional uh, structural element and strength in that area. Every project has change orders, it seems like, these days. So far, we've uh, added three pile caps, uh, three piles, excuse me, 30 foot of pile cap, six splice pile kits to be used into the buildings for a future um, contract, and stringers and deck boards. And here's an example of, of why you have to have change orders and why you have to react. This is a pile cap. Uh, it's been cut in half, but before it was taken apart, you could look all around the exterior of that and you would, ne would have never seen anything wrong but you look in the middle and it's almost hollow. So what we refer to as being good wood is there's about 10% good wood, so it's really not doing its job. So the contract has to be pretty fluid. And whenever we find things like this, we just add it to the contract as a change order. That's a 12 by 12 inch by 12 inch timber. That's a pile cap that sets on top of the piles. Uh, we received a low bid for this year's work from Shock Construction Company. They've worked on the wharf many, many times in the past couple decades. A low bid of $114,000, and that's just for labor only. The overall projects included in our annually in our capital improvement program for $400,000. Part of that, or most of that money, is actually spent on the materials procured by the waterfront and made available to the contractor. We also keep a heavy timber inventory, and the inventory 
is about enough to replace three to five vents along the roadway, and that's piles, piles, caps, stringers, deck boards, and everything. So you can imagine if you had a, a really rough year where a section of the wharf washed out, especially the roadway, we have enough material on hand to go out, put it back together as quickly as possible to open it up. My other item this evening is facilities management software. Um, this is software commonly used for facilities divisions, all types of facilities divisions, to uh, plan, maintenance, and document facilities conditions. It's typically used for very large buildings, uh, water distribution, wastewater collection, and uh, similar things like that. We have it in eight city departments, are currently using the same uh, software, and we're uh, considering an upgrade, mainly because the license, the, this new soft, the software we're not using now is no longer going to be supported. Cartograph is the software application that we use. We use it at the waterfront to manage our marinas and our buildings. We generate work orders related to repair requests and preventive maintenance items that can remind us to go out monthly and check all the lights and things like that. We track labor and materials for all repair and maintenance. And uh, part of the reporting is, is how we develop our metrics for productivity for our staff and for our performance measures that we report to you every year as part of our budget process. It's important to note that Cartograph is not used on Stearns Wharf. Stearns Wharf is a very big and complicated asset, and it's difficult to kind of track that facility. Our Information Services Division um, is, has coordinated the efforts to replace the software currently used by these eight city departments. They've evaluated several software applications and decided to go with Cartograph's successor uh, software application called Operations Management Software, OMS. It was preferred by a majority of the city departments. It turned out to be considerably less expensive, more versatile, and most importantly, user-friendly. OMS, uh, the initial cost is $51,000 to the waterfront share. That includes a needs assessment, training, and an annual license. We felt that a needs assessment was essential because most of the software is set up for buildings, wastewater collection, water distribution, and not for things like marinas. So you need to kind of parse out what in a marina is suitable to track as a facility. So that takes some customization. And we're also going to look at the feasibility of documenting our maintenance of Stearns Wharf. Currently, we use uh, Microsoft's Access database, but there's only one staff member that really knows how to use it. Uh, it's kind of difficult to track what's going on. We have 2,000 piles, four acres of deck boards, uh, over a mile of hand guardrail, those kind of things. And it's just really difficult to document what, what you're doing. So we believe that we can work with Cartograph and incorporate Stearns Wharf into that and, and do a much better job documenting what we're doing. Uh, we have an annual license fee of $16,700 per year, which is uh, about four times what we paid for their previous version. It just so happens this is probably half of what the next uh, software package that's available to us. It's a pretty expensive thing to do. Uh, one difference is the old software license, $4,500, was a limited number of licenses to everybody in the city. With this new license, everybody in the waterfront will have a license and access to it, which will be kind of nice. So all of my staff will be able to go in and use it and find out the condition of whatever facility they're working on, document their work, and it helps us better document, plan, and predict what we need to do into the future. And that concludes my report this evening. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Treiberg. Any questions? I just had one. Uh, so just real quick, so uh, shock construction is our low bidder, and we buy the material ourselves and provide it for them to put together? Air Spicer, that's correct. Okay, great. Okay. Just wanted to follow up. Thank you. We are on to new business. Uh, item 11, municipal codes. Is that Mr. Cronman? It is indeed, Mr. Chair. Please, sorry, okay. thank you. Item 11, Municipal Code Amendments, recommendation that Harbor Commission receive a report on amendments to section 17.20.005 of the Santa Barbara Municipal Code and recommend adoption of those amendments to City Council. Please. Mr. Chair and Commissioners, uh, by way of background, uh, each year, uh, those of you who've been here for a while know this, uh, we annually review Title 17 of the Municipal Code, which is the harbor, uh, so that we can continue to uh, up update and, and provide a legal framework for the programs and policies uh, that we administer at the waterfront. 
Uh, it's a very, it's a most important because we can't enforce the laws, we can't actually do the programs and, and advance the, and, and, and administer the policies we have unless we have a really solid legal background and legal framework for doing that. So uh, what we're going to talk about tonight are two different aspects of uh, 1720.005, which is the slip assignment policy uh, section of, of the uh, uh, Title 17. And one is the time frame for a permittee to replace a sold, donated, stolen, or destroyed vessel. And the other is a lottery list assignment fee. Both of those will become more clear as I move forward here. So on the uh, replacement of a vessel. So currently, the Municipal Code says in, in uh, 17.2005b3 that a, an individual, a slip permittee, if they have a vessel lost, stolen, it's typically, it's typically sold. But if it leaves the slip for any one of a number of reasons, they have 120 days to replace it. The primary reason for this was so that people didn't sit on slips for their, for their the quote, uh, the underground, uh, the private sector value of that municipal water space, that, that the slips were utilized for boats and boating. And so, you know, a, a time uh, limit was placed on that, and it's worked for many, many years. But in discussions that the director and I had with brokers and members of the boating community, uh, it was explained to us that uh, 120 days after you sell a boat, after you've completed the plate paperwork and closed on that boat and done all of that, you're usually 30 days into that 120 days already, and now you're not down to 90 days, and unless you have a boat under construction, under construction or sitting in a slip somewhere else that you're gonna bring into the harbor or uh, on a delivery ship coming from somewhere, it's difficult to meet that 120-day requirement. And what happens as a function of that is the permittee is likely to place a quote-unquote filler boat in their slip. That's a boat on which they place their name just to hold the spot there. And that's typically tied out to a sub-rent. In other words, you know, somebody comes in and says, I can help you out if you need to buy time, you know, if it, if it takes you a little longer to find your boat. I'll fill, I'll fill the slip. You put your name on my, uh, you, my, my, uh, my vessel. We'll be co-owners of the boat, but you'll still be the slip permittee. And, um, uh, and then uh, I'll pay the rent. The sub-rent portion of it is usually what happens. So in, in an effort to try and, and, and give folks more latitude and, uh, and, and more time and leeway to get the boat in the slip that they want, um, we, are, we are proposing to extend that 120 days to 180 days. What would that do? It would hopefully discourage the filler boats and sub-rents, plus it would increase the availability of that slip for transient berthing. So we're hoping this would be a win-win. So that, that is that one. I, I can stop there if you have any questions, or I can, I can go, Mr. Chair, and do both of them at once. Uh, and does the commission, anyone have questions at this point? Commissioner Gray. I have one question. Has, has there been a complaint about this? I mean, I'm wondering what the, changes. The concern has been advanced by the broker community in particular on behalf of, of folks buying and selling boats. So there have been specific complaints. They came to us and asked for this amendment. Thank you. Sure. Please continue. Okay. Um, re regarding the lottery list assignment fee, so this, this gets to our wait lists, which are, of course, a topic of great discussion at the waterfront, and they have been since the 1970s when we began maintaining a waiting list to, uh, for assignment of slips that revert to the city. How do slips revert to the city? Well, it's either via voluntary relinquishment, which is relatively rare, but it does happen, or permit termination. And there are usually two ways permits get terminated, either for uh, a lack of you know, non-payment of slip fees or for, uh, let's call it misbehavior, uh, we've had some of both in the past, uh, and so that's how we get uh, slips uh, back into city uh, control and are able to access the waiting list. In 2005, though, city council adopted a, a new uh, three-tiered waiting list structure, uh, a master waiting list, a sub-master waiting list, and a lottery list, and we're going to need to go through all three of these so we, we uh, understand exactly what we're advancing here today. So the master waiting list, which was closed in the year 2000 to new applicants because it was skyrocketing out of control for people signing up for really something they had no hope of ever getting. It would have gone into the hundreds, possibly even thousands of people waiting, a uh, waiting for a slip and us charging $40 a year for just for them to be on the list. It really wasn't good public policy. It wasn't fair to them, and it, and it would have been a, an administrative uh, headache considerable. 
So the, how is the ma what master waiting list structured? Well, when people signed up on the master waiting list dating back several decades, they were asked to sign up in a slip size category, okay? They could sign up for 25, this is just an example we've splashed up here, 25s, 30s, 35s, 40s, and it goes on, 43s, 45s, 50s, 51, 60, et cetera. But we, we just took a snapshot here to show you the typical uh, sizes of slips that people might have signed up for on the master waiting list. We've highlighted the 35s because we're gonna use that as an example moving forward. So Mr. Roberts and Ms. Fernandez and Mr. Washington, let's say, who signed up in 80, 85, and 90, all in the 35-foot uh, category. As Mr. Roberts was assigned a slip, Mr. Ms. Fernandez would have uh, moved to number one, and when she was assigned a slip, Mr. Washington would have moved up, et cetera, et cetera, until the uh, uh, slip size category was eventually depleted or exhausted, as we say. So the submaster waiting list includes all of this, the 25 people who are currently on the master waiting list, but they're ranked chronologically by applica application date regardless of slip size category for which people signed up. What does that mean? Well, it means that it's accessed when a slip becomes available from one of those depleted slip size categories. So going back, let's assume for the sake of discussion, all the 35s were assigned over a period of 15 years, right? Well, then we would access the, the submaster list and what is the submaster? Well, let's see, there's nobody on the 35-foot list, so we look at the submaster list, and this is the collapsed list, of, uh, collapsed version of the master uh, list with all the names listed in uh, chronological order, regardless of slip size category. So here we see Roberts, Fernandez, and Washington again, but they're not right stacked behind one another. Instead, they're filtered in between others who Mr. Jones, he signed up or she signed up in 1976, and if, say, a 30-foot slip became available, they would be offered to that person first and then so on down the list, okay? I'm going to stop there to see if there are any questions so far because I know this, this is high math. It is for me, always has been, and, and uh, I'd be, I'd be no happy math. to answer any questions so far if there are any. Any okay. questions from the council? Okay. I'm following. Okay, good. Thank you. So the, the lottery list is the the lottery waiting list is the final of the three that in 2005 City Council adopted as a th as the three tiered waiting list system, and the lottery waiting waiting list is subordinate to both the master and the submaster lists. It was created and periodically replenished by lottery, and that list itself was ranked by lottery draw, not by chronology because it's all picked out of the drum. We've been here for those drawings. I think we had one just a few months ago. And it's, and it's always replenished up to a limit of 50, which we did just a few months ago. And it's accessed when an available slip permit is not assigned from either the master waiting list or passed by folks on the submaster waiting list. So it, it begs the question, why would somebody on the submaster list, the entire submaster list, not take a slip when it was offered to them, right? The answer is they're waiting for a 35, 40, 45 foot slip. And so you see the, the last bullet here um, or the next to last, um, it's, a, it's uh, well, I, I apologize, I got ahead of myself. So the new, the new uh, three-tiered waiting list structure it included, for the lottery list, it included an assignment fee. Unlike the other two lists, don't require any fee for accepting a slip permit off that list. But this assignment fee, which is advanced by the Harbor Commission and, and staff uh, and the commission agreed and went ahead as part of uh, their budget document several years ago um, uh, was added to the quote unquote uh, cost of taking an assignment from the lottery list. And the idea at the time as it was articulated from the commission uh, was to discourage what were thought of as windfall profits. And we've seen windfall profits in the past. We saw it in 1999 when Marina One was uh, expanded, adding QRNS when people who knew you know, what might happen uh, with that expansion, we're able to make some profits on it. In order to, to dissuade that, the, the city council adopted a waitlist transfer fee, which is a five-year inversely graduated fee, which charges folks a whole lot of money if they get something off the waiting list and transfer it again within five years. But also they, uh, they added this lottery list assignment fee. But typically, and this is what I started to say earlier, I apologize for jumping the gun, which slips become available most often to the lottery list? It's the small ones. 
because if you're waiting for a 35-foot slip and a 30-foot slip comes available and you've waited since 1993, you're going to take it if you, from the submaster list, right? So once, so once the, the offers have percolated through the submaster list and the quote-unquote leftovers are left for lottery list assignment, it's usually 20s and maybe the occasional 25-foot, but, but even the 25s are usually taken off the submaster list as well. So we end up with basically 20-foot slips, and, and that's all to, there is to offer. And remember, now we're going to get into the assignment fee part of this. So we have all, just 20 footers basically are, are usually available to the lottery list applicants. So in 2008, when we had a surplus of these available 20 foot slips, but people were disinclined to take them because of the cost of the, of the uh, assignment fee, um, there we, the council adopted a resolution to create a special one time 20 foot lottery list to ad address that growing inventory. We had 63 applicants for those 20-foot slips. That was the good news. The bad news is it took us four years to issue five permits. Again, people were taken by surprise. Oh, even though it was in the applications and what have you, you know, it's understandable that, you know, people didn't latch on to that assignment fee part. So it took us several years just to assign five slips, which was doing, wasn't doing the boating public any good. It wasn't doing waterfront staff any good countless times offering and re-offering and re-offering uh, slip assignments to people only to have them bounce back to us. And it's actually, quite frankly, pretty costly, too, in terms of time and effort to, uh, to undertake that. So our ability to in assign the 20-foot slips from the lottery list was, again, the $4,000 assignment fee, which is equivalent to the uh, $200 a foot assignment fee at the time, the transfer fee at the time, which, as you know, has since been frozen. It was frozen uh, several years ago. So we're recommending at this point the elimination of the lottery list assignment fee. That's the bottom line here. Uh, we believe it would expedite assignments of smaller slips and it would better accommodate the boating public. So in conclusion, relative to both of these items that have been before you here uh, tonight, is that we believe these amendments will help accommodate slip permittees wishing to purchase replacement boats for the slips in a reasonable time frame and eliminate burdensome financial requirements for lottery waiting list applicants. Both amendments, uh, again, would help accommodate boating in Santa Barbara Harbor. And regarding timeline, uh, with, with, with your approval, uh, we would move forward to ordinance and, and uh, committee and city council this summer to finalize this and have it uh, added to the Santa Barbara Municipal Code. And that concludes my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Cronman? I have a quick question. Commissioner sure. McIntosh. How many uh, vacant 20-foot slips do we currently have, Mr. Cronman? Mr. Chair, Commissioner McIntosh, I believe we have one. So in your professional opinion, do you think we need to get rid of this assignment fee to get that one filled? Or is it more looking toward the future to be fair and more expeditious when we have additional 20 foot slips available it's both i think i think i think the director wants to weigh in uh, mr chair commissioner mcintosh our harbor is we have a lot of 20 foot slips in our inventory you know most of the slips in our harbor are 30 foot or less and a huge number of those are 20 footers and what we're seeing in the in the boating industry and in the marina industry is that 20 foot slips are not you know the the trend is toward larger and wider vessels and you can easily take a 20 footer and put it on a trailer and park it in your driveway so we don't want to end up like other marinas have with a whole bunch of vacant 20 foot slips so we want to remove this obstacle this four thousand dollar obstacle to getting um, in the way of assigning these slips. We want to keep them full and, and keep the marina full. Okay, thank you. And then the second half of my question is, what's the financial impact going to be? My question. On an average, if we look at the last 10 years, what's this assignment fee turned into for the waterfront, waterfront budget? Commissioner McIntosh, if you're looking at what the fiscal impact of, of implementing this proposal would be, the budgetary impact. Yeah. It, it, it'd be $4,000 uh, per assignment of, of a slip. It's not a, a big revenue issue. It's more about good public policy and accommodating the boating public. I understand on a per slip basis, but how many 20-foot slips transfer or are assigned every year? Well, it varies. On, a, on average, yeah. Like it, it varies. The I last I, 10 years. Over 10 years, I'd say 
six or seven, maybe eight, something like that. Okay. It took us five years to get rid of, to, to get four years to get rid of five. Mm -hmm. Or five years to get rid of four, I'd have to go back. But. <laughs> okay, thank you. Question for yeah, my, my, my questions were the same as Commissioner McIntosh. So it, it does sound like it's, it's really policy driven. It's not a financial drive. That's correct. Okay. Both these amendments that we're proposing tonight are liberalizations of the code and, and are not, uh, not revenue. Neither one is revenue driven. We're trying to just, uh, you know, um, have crisper and sounder public policy on these issues. Very good. I guess at this point, if there aren't any other questions, I would uh, entertain a motion. I'll, I'll make the motion and just wanted to comment. This is, this is government uh, being friendly to its constituents and citizens, so I won't question it too much. And I think you know, <laughs> you're being very responsive as usual, so thank you. And that's, there's a motion in there. Second. We have a first and a second. All, right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any abstentions? Any nays? Passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll now take a deep breath and then we'll move on to our next item. Mr. Kruger. Item 12, please. <clears throat> annual review, clean marina program recommendation that Harbor Commission review and consider an annual report on the department's clean marina program. Back to you, Mr. Cromman. Mr. Chair, thank you. It's my privilege tonight to present to you the 2016 annual review of our Clean Marina program. Um, by way of background, uh, as you may know, we, the city adopted this program in 2002 with a goal to achieve and maintain best management practices and a clean harbor environment for people, aquatic life, and seabirds. And your commission annually reviews the program to, no, to uh, the program's progress and effectiveness. There are six elements to the program. I won't go through them one by one here because we're going to go into them individually as I move forward. So facilities for boaters is the first project element. So the cornerstone of that, of course, is our sewage pump outs. We have five pump out stations. Uh, in FY15, they uh, uh, were used 5,218 minutes, but more importantly, in, in uh, uh, more terms that's easier to grasp, that represents 200,000 gallons of sewage diverted to the city sewer system from wherever else it might have ended up. Also, we also had gotten approval recently for a grant application for $73,000 to rebuild four of the most used pump outs. And as you can see uh, by the graph on the right, Pump out level has kind of uh, flattened uh, over the last uh, few years. One of our theories, and it's speculation, some, you'll see some of these uh, go up and down, and we're always trying to figure out why. We first look at our equipment and our calibrations and, and potential lab errors for things like, you know, bacteria and what have you. So what you're going to hear are, are theories and, and what we think are plausible and what have you. But as Carl's been so successfully uh, implementing his uh, Marina One reconstruction program over the last few years, we've had two months of the year where we essentially had uh, big chunks of Marina One uh, unavailable. And those, those bigger boats, the ones we see in Marina One, uh, are often, often the ones who use the sewage pump outs the most, the, you know, the boats with the fully equipped galleys and heads and what have you. And so, you know, it's flatlining for the last few years, but I don't look at that as a good news or bad news, I, I just go with the, the good news of, you know, diverting 200,000 gallons of, of uh, sewage into the uh, city sewer system. But here's a curious, this is almost counterintuitive, the bilge water pump out at the fuel dock, meanwhile, in 2015, removed 7,370 gallons of, of uh, bilge water, which is great news, it's a 30, but it's a 32% uh, spike above the 12-year average. So I, I, you know, I could speculate about why that is. People are maintaining their boats more in their, you know, in their, in their uh, slips. You know, they're they're hauling out, you know, they're hauling out less to have that done in a yard. I, I really don't know, but the good news is, it's getting a lot of use. And as you can see, that's a, that's a, that's about five gallons a minute, uh, and 7,300 gallons is a lot of bilge water to remove. And again, and I've said it before. I think this is one of the main reasons you don't often see oily sheen on the waters of Santa Barbara Harbor because number one, people are using the bilge pump out and number two, 
people are reporting it instantly if there's a sheen and Harbor Patrol and Coast Guard investigate. So it's really far, far from where it was decades ago in terms of, of uh, petroleum products in the Bay. Debris nets, we have over 40 of these uh, scattered throughout the harbor. There's one on each finger dock. We pre replaced parts equivalent to 10 nets in 2015. This is pretty stock as we, uh, um, uh, as it has been the last past three years. Uh, and also when Carl's crews are in the field on the Marina One project or doing like, you know, dock and deck work in marinas two, three, and four, they're always on the look for these. So that's when these get spotted typically and reported and replaced. So kudos to him and his staff because they're the ones that usually on top of this. Waste oil disposal, another cornerstone of our uh, facilities aspect of this. So we continue to manage three free waste oil disposal stations. And I say free, that's for slip permittees and, and those with the gate access cards uh, to uh, access these. Um, except the one on the fuel dock is, is free to anybody in the harbor. Um, uh, but anyway, the, the three that we operate in the, or the two that we operate, I apologize, the three that we operate, including the fuel dock, Marina 1 and Marina 4, and FY15 uh, took in 4,620 gallons of oil and oil products. That's slightly below the five-year average, but well above FY14 when we reported 2,500 gallons but we believe that was an anomalous reading. Uh, we believe it was a, it was a uh, an accounting error, and uh, but we believe uh, this five-year average and where we hit last year is just about what we average most years, somewhere in the 4,000 plus gallons of oil removed from the harbor from these waste oil waste oil uh, dumping facilities. That's a lot of oil too. Marine battery collection. So the city pier bin, uh, it's right out there by the uh, fuel dock and ice machine. Um, in, uh, we've collected 1,900, almost 2,000 batteries since 2000. And as you see on the graph on the right, the number of batteries uh, disposed there, and I think it was like uh, 1.8 or it was 220 last year, um, has tend to flatline. And I think it's because uh, I talked to the folks at the fuel dock, and, it's, and I think it has something to do with folks taking a bag and getting their batteries somewhere where they can get a higher value for the core value of the battery. And so they're not putting as many in the recycle bin. Um, I don't think many people are putting them in the bay anymore. If That's for no other reason, the core value is so considerable when they turn it in and buy a new battery. But nonetheless, 220 batteries a year is a pretty good rate of uh, recycling these batteries and, and keeping them out of the bay. So I think in total in clean sweep, we've probably gotten about a half a dozen batteries in the 10 years we've done oper Operation Clean Sweep. It could be seven. But overall, it hasn't been the major factor that people thought it might be when the program started. So that's the good news on this, too. Fishing line recycling. So we operate or we, we oversee, if you will, or coordinate with our partners, three monofilament fishing line recycling stations, one on Stern's Wharf, excuse me, one at Stern's Wharf Bait and Tackle, one on the fishing vessel Stardust, and one on the fishing vessel Coral Sea. So in 2015, uh, five and a half pounds came from the Stern's Wharf uh, uh, facility of uh, Stearns Wharf um, a mono recycling uh, unit and 27 pounds of monofilament were collected on the sport fishing boat Stardust. Now I'm going to stop for a minute and, and, and enjoy a mode, moment of immodesty here. What happened with the Stardust was we talked to Jason Diamond, the owner of the Stardust, about mounting a, a, a recycling, uh, monofilament recycling unit on his boat last year, and he thought it was a great idea. Uh, Jason's a wonderful man and a wonderful uh, partner on environmental projects. So that's the one on the left. That was on the Stardust. And then we worked with our partners at the state, at DBA and the NGOs that work in, in, in affiliation with DBA on, the, on, uh, on the recycling issues. And we showed them what we came up with, which is really a small unit that's available from janitorial supply uh, houses. And they said, that is fantastic. And what they did was they've not only reached out to 24 different sport fishing operations in San Francisco Bay, but now they've reached out statewide trying to, trying to market uh, this instead of what you see. Well, I don't have the picture of the one on Stern's Wharf, but they have this big foghorn type thing that uh, they used to use. They're, they're switching over to these kinds of containers, and, um, and they've actually used the dimensions of that container to reconfigure the signage that you see on the left to a sticker that you see on the right to match their con that container. So we're, 
We're very proud, we, we being us and our, and our fishing partners uh, in the harbor, that we've sort of, um, I don't know, benchmarked what the, what the gold standard is for mono recycling on sport fishing boats. And so that's what the, you'll see that. If you see this in other boats and other harbors, you'll know where it came from. Okay. Water quality. So we monitor dry season water quality. Uh, we don't do it in the winter because it wouldn't be, you, you couldn't tell wheat from chaff, right? You, you, stuff coming down the watershed would be uh, mixed in with, with regular harbor water and it would be a, you know, a waste of time. So for several years, we've tested April through Octo October for three bacterial indicators, total coliform, fecal coliform, total coliform, fecal coliform, and enterococcus. And one sample of total coliform, and it's in your attachments, exceeded state standards in um, uh, last year. And it was at Station 13. If you notice, Station 13 is actually all the way outside the harbor. It's kind of a control station, uh, one in which, to which we compare the other stations. But that was the only one that had an exceedance, and it was actually almost two and a half times the normal um, uh, allowable amount uh, per state standards for body contact. So we thought about it, we speculated and talked about it. We thought, is this animal waste? Is this boat dumping? And because the same day's test sample uh, that the folks at El Estero help us analyze had z levels approaching zero for enterococcus and levels approaching zero for uh, fecal coliform, um, we decided that the most likely answer is a lab error because one would expect if total coliform was two and a half times the state standard, it would percolate down in somewhere in the, in the other readings in fecal coliform and enterococcus. There would be an indicator that something was awry. So that's our best guess, but the good news is that was the only upset out of seven tests at 13 stations between April and October. East Beach water quality monitoring. So the... Uh, the East Beach uh, mooring area has been in place for 10 years now. Uh, it, uh, it's tested twice a year for heavy metals and three times a year for bacteria. And in 2015, the samples were consistent with our baseline results as they have been every year, indicating good water quality. The great news here is that because the samples have been clean for 10 years, uh, per conditions of the Coastal C Commission permit when we set up the mooring area, we uh, now can um, waive, the testing requirement will be waived moving forward, which will be an $8,000 annual savings to our clean marina program. So we're pretty, pretty thrilled about that part. Dissolved oxygen tests. So as you may remember, DO tests are used to predict low, uh, low uh, oxygen levels in the harbor that cause uh, dead loss and fish die-offs. We no first notice the dead loss typically in lobster and crab traps and what have you. But if you walk down the breakwater wall under Brophy Brothers and see little pie plates turned upside down, little flatfishes or, or anchovies swimming sideways, you usually know it's a sign the oxygen is low, and so we jump on it. So besides doing our standard 12 tests, we do tests when environmental conditions warrant that we should get out there and test the oxygen levels. The tests, as your attachments indicate, indicated uh, generally good dissolved oxygen levels. There were exceptions. They were typically poorer in spring and fall, as they have been in the last couple, uh, uh, actually last several years. That's, that's fairly common. That's less than five parts. I believe it's per million. Uh, of, uh, but but it's, 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 it, the threshold is five, and we've had readings in three, two, and, and what have you. And you see that in the spring and the fall. But this year we had some very poor readings in October, and that's when the harbor water temperature was 72 degrees, and El Nino was really piping through the channel, and we had trigger fish at the islands and sea snakes washing up on, you know, on Oxnard shores and what have you. And, and so there was a lot, of, a lot of warm water, which tends to be oxygen deprived as opposed to the colder water, which tends to be oxygen rich. In fact, when those uh, pelagic red crabs washed ashore a couple of weeks ago, you probably read it about it in the news or you saw it on Ledbetter Beach, we were asked by the fishermen to test the dissolved oxygen levels because they, a lot of us, associate it with an El Nino phenomenon, which it may be, you know, with the leftover, leftovers of our current El Nino. And we tested it, and the numbers were in the eights and nines, the, the highest oxygen levels I've seen in my 16 years here at the harbor. So, but the water temperature was 56 degrees, so the water is completely turned over. 
And despite the presence of these red crabs, the water, the water quality remains very, very good. But as a reminder, the fishermen or anybody should report dead loss or anything indicating low oxygen to us. We will, post, we will, we will uh, uh, test the, the harbor waters and, and we will post the uh, gates if there is uh, abnormal water uh, uh, dissolved oxygen levels. Anti-fouling paints, we've, we've tried to keep pace with, uh, uh, with the changes in the industry and with public policy relative to um, uh, bottom paints on boats. As you know, uh, ever since 2009, there's been a lot of attention and paid to copper-based bottom paints. Um, as some harbors are under very strict restrictions relative to, to copper bottom paints, we're, we're keeping pace and keeping our regional board involved, regional, regional water quality control board involved with what we're doing. And we've tried a lot of stuff. We've tried ceramic-based, zinc-based, biocidal paints, and without going into granular detail here, all of them underperformed relative to what we need on our harbor patrol boats. Those are the ones we're testing them on, and, and uh, they have to function on those boats if they're going to function on anything. They peeled off, they've proved too delicate, they've warmed down prematurely, we have all kinds of problems. But there is still good news. The latest alternative paints have reduced the amount of copper and blended it with the biocide, uh, and so the copper content is only about 66%. I know that's like, you know, still two-thirds of the apple is there, and we'd like to get rid of it completely, but no copper hasn't worked for us. So we're experimenting with, on our, experimenting with this uh, two-thirds copper blend, if you will, on our maintenance work barge. And if it's successful, we'll apply it to patrol boat one this summer. And here is a picture of the bottom of our maintenance barge being painted with this alternative paint about a month ago. So we also participated in the, indus in the industry clean marina program, which is a multi-state industry-sponsored certification program designed to reflect compliance with best management practices and, and environmental protection to prevent any ocean pollution. It was established in 2004 and now includes, uh, and this is pretty significant, includes 127 certified marinas. And this was actually industry taking on the responsibility of developing its own program and the Coastal Commission agreed that that was okay. They monitor it very closely, the state does, to make sure you know that the that the threshold that the that the 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 things being measured you know like hazard how storage of hazardous waste or signage or sewage pump outs or bilge pad recycling uh, facilities are, um, are are up to snuff and so it's a robust program as I said we got certified in 2006 we'll be we were recertified it's a five year cert we were recertified in 2011. And working with my colleague, Mr. Triberg, we're going to uh, have our next recertification this fall in 2016. So this will be our third recertification as participants in this program. So best management practices. So in, in compliance with the Clean Water Act standards, we have a stormwater pollution prevention plan, and that, that describes potential sources from stormwater discharge, uh, plus best management practices to prevent them. Uh, examples would be parking lots, trash enclosures behind restaurants, and things like that. This year there were significant changes, or last year there were significant changes. Um, uh, per the Regional, Quality, Regional Water Quality Control Board, uh, the visual obs observations that we're required to make are now um, uh, monthly, not quarterly, in all the industrial areas of the harbor. And now we're required to capture four storm event samples per year versus two. We can only hope we get four storm event samples uh, versus two. And we remain compliant with all aspects of the stormwater pollution prevention plan. We also have best management practices for our divers. All our divers and hull cleaning companies are certified uh, and trained for uh, how to um, clean the bottoms of boats in the most uh, efficient way so as to not allow sloughing of, car of uh, copper into the harbor. We are having a new recertification class on June 11th next month, and it's put on by the California Professional Divers Association, which is the group that has worked with the California EPA uh, and the California Coastal Commission uh, to, to be uh, certified, if you will, and I don't know if that's the right term, but to be the approved professional diving association to undertake this training and educate our, our uh, business activity permit holders, our, our hull divers, and Harbor Patrol takes part in this too. So all Harbor Patrol officers on a rolling basis as we have retirements and new hires and what have you are trained in this so they know what kind of practice should be employed and what to look for as they 
uh, move through the harbor that could be a pollution incident that is not in compliance with these best management practices. We also distribute uh, oil absorbent pads, uh, grant funded, thankfully, thankfully, by the state's Cal Recycle Division. Um, pads for mop up bilges and prevent leaks while you're fueling. It's kind of a big number. We uh, do 50, we gave away 15,000 in FY15, and that's three consecutive years of, uh, of that level, and 216,000 uh, pads distributed since 03. Uh, that's a lot of pads. And um, why has it been consistent over the last several years? We believe it's because we finally started limiting people to how many pads they take. People were coming in and grabbing lots of pads like this, and the fuel dock and, and, uh, and our waterfront staff got together and said, let's, you know, let's take a hefty measure and call it that. And, and people have been very compliant with that, no complaints. So, you know, who knows how many pads are sitting under people's cars in their garages. But we went to limit the pads, and we've got a pretty steady 15,000 a year now. Bird protection, uh, in coordination with the Wildlife Care Network, uh, we undertake uh, uh, the collection of deceased birds, but also the care for wounded birds. Last year, we saw a significant spike in dead or rescued birds, and speaking with the Wildlife Care Network, it was mostly cormorants and, co and common murres. Uh, again, El Nino took its, took its toll because there was a lack of forage fish. That oxygen-depleted water, right, usually has less forage fish in it. And, and so um, the lack of forage fish resulted in a lot of mortalities. It's also reflected in, in our salad boat report, our annual report, which is an attachment to this uh, staff report. Marine mammal rescue. So we coordinate with the Channel Islands Marine Wildlife Institute on this. Um, and we had a high number of rescues. This is just like the birds. In, in uh, calendar year of 15, we had 99 rescues. You can see that's about twice the average. Mostly young pups. Uh, they had difficulty sustaining themselves due to the lack of forage fish. So this we feel pretty confident on talking with the Simwe people, just as we talked with the Wildlife Care Network people. We, f we feel like we know the reasons uh, these numbers are what they are. Numbers aren't so high in the first half of FY16, but pupping season is in the second half of FY16, so we'll, we'll wait to see uh, how bad this really gets. Pollution prevention and abatement. So we have the salad boat. This is the contractor who works every other Saturday down uh, at the docks, from the docks and from a small skiff collecting um, uh, debris, kelp, sticks, styrofoam cups, it's all in here, tennis balls, plastic bags, tree limbs, et cetera, kelp. And what we're learning over the years is the west-facing docks, especially the docks in Marina, One's, Marina One that face the west, act like a comb, have a comb effect to them, and that's where a significant percentage of the debris collects. So they're able to actually best utilize their time when they do this uh, bi-weekly cleanup, where they go to the hot spots first and then they cover the rest of the harbor. Uh, again, many deceased birds, which don't show up in the bird rescues, they just show up in this report. So a lot of deceased birds in the last year, cormorants and common murs in particular. There were no major extra cleanups last year, which you'll see in, our, in, the, uh, in the financials at the end of this report, because that saved us a lot of money too. But so there, was no, there were no storms that carried a lot of Arundo into the harbor. We didn't get kelp landlocked this year because of storms. So it was just business as usual every other week and uh, it, it worked really well. So our abandoned watercraft abatement and vessel turn-in grants, which we get from the Division of Boating Waterway, Waterways. In the last year, we depleted a $10,000 AWAF grant that we had for abandoned watercraft, and we used it to dispose of five vessels in FY15. You can see uh, it's up and down. It's up a little bit from the previous year, but uh, down from past years. And if you look back at FY10, 9, 8, 7, 6, that's when there were a lot more boats in the East Beach Anchorage, and I'm going to get into the reasons why here in a moment, but I drove by, Scott and I drove by the, the East Beach Anchorage the other day, and we counted nine or ten boats in the Anchorage, and there have been years at this time in mid to late May where you'd see 40 boats in the East Beach Anchorage. And so this partially reflects the fact fewer boats in the Anchorage, fewer boats on the beach. An even, an even more important element in that, we believe, is, is our vessel turn-in program, which is also grant-funded through DBA. This is a program by which an individual can voluntarily surrender a boat 
We go up, uh, they, they get a junk certificate at, at DMV, they sign it over to the city, we work with our waste hauler in the boat yard, and it goes to boat heaven. It just it disappears, and it doesn't end up in the anchorage. That's the key. When somebody sells it, when somebody transfers a slip and puts a new boat in it, and their old boat, they, they, they sell it, you know, the old dollar boat syndrome, they sell it for next to nothing. That's what was primarily populating the East Beach anchorage. I'm not saying it's going to go to numbers approaching zero in the anchorage because it's an amenity that we're happy to provide for people. You know, it's city waters, and it's, the, and it's a, a, a de designated anchorage on the charts. I'm just saying the problem with boats going beaching, getting grounded from the East Beach anchorage, goes down, I believe, proportional to the number of boats that are out there. And the number of boats that are out there, I believe, is a reflection of how many boats we're getting rid of through the AWAF and especially the VTIP program. To help complicate things, uh, DBA just combined those two grant programs into what's called a surrendered and abandoned vessel exchange program, uh, the SAVE program. So there's no more VTIP, there's no more AWAF, it's combined into a SAVE program that jurisdictions, municipalities like ours, can use the money in a discretionary fashion for surrendered boats or abandoned boats. So it, it, it creates a lot more latitude for the, receiving, the grant receiving agencies to use that money. And this is good for, through September of 2017. I wanted to put this next bullet, the indented one about the 12 vessels in here so you can get an idea or underscore what I was just talking about, the anchorage and what have you. We have 12 vessels pending disposal or disposed of through the SAVE program to date in FY16. So people are really catching on to the fact that if I have a boat and I don't want it, and I'm thinking about doing something with it that would probably be bad for the environment, ultimately, or bad for the city, or bad for, you know, boating, or the, what have you, they call us, and, we, and if we can work it out with them, it's on a trailer, we usually tell them, it's on a trailer, you can take it to the dump yourself. You can take it to Marburg and have it recycled. But if it's in a slip, and the slip is transferring, or if it's coming in from the anchorage, we've had several boats turned in from the anchorage, uh, we, have the, we have the means of getting rid of them, and, and this, is, this number of boats is growing and growing. It's a good thing. So onward, Operation Clean Sweep, you heard all about it tonight. Uh, we've now got 17.7 .7 tons over the first 10 years. And so now education. This is uh, one of the uh, most important aspects of our Clean Marina program. We disseminate all kinds of Clean Marina information via various publications. You see it in the news, you see it in the newspapers. We have brochures, which we call pollution brochures that, that uh, uh, Harbor Patrol hands out. They have best management practices for all kinds of boating activities. Our recent outreach efforts include, uh, we've posted Spanish and English oil disposal signs at marina disposal sites and community recycling centers. What are those? When we get our grant from Cal Recycle, we're not only obligated and happy to do it, we're ob you know, to maintain oil disposal facilities and proper signage and what have you. We're obligated to work with folks like Jiffy Lube, for example, to make sure those uh, designated oil recycling centers around town have the proper signage and, and are engaging in best management practices and what have you. So we, in particular, Dominique Samari, our, our, our uh, administrative analyst, has visited all of those sites and helped coordinate with them to make sure they're maintaining their obligations under this Recy Cal Recycle grant. We're participating in UCSB's microbial source tracking project. I'm the, I'm the liaison, the designee for that. And when you, what that is, and it's in its second year, uh, the Bren School has undertaken a project where they're trying to determine the watershed source of microbial pollutants that end up reaching the waterfront, the harbor, the ocean, from Ledbetter down past, uh, past East Beach. And they've been happy to receive every year. In fact, I just sent them the copy of this Clean Marina report because then it saves them a lot of work trying to figure out what kind of efforts are being made in the harbor related to back and what kind of testing we're doing related to bacterial elements. So we continue to be uh, participants in that. And we are also maintaining an email, a fisherman's list serve, which has really been helpful and has been growing as well. And what is that? That's reminders uh, to fishermen to dispose of their trash and dead bait or crabs. We've had some, some pollution and uh, 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 odor pollution issues with dead crabs and bait and trash on the docks. But it also gives us the uh, opportunity to remind them when the ice machine is going to you know, be down for a couple of days or, uh, or it's you know, being you know, under a major remodel or, or maintenance project. And we can also update the fishermen on legislative actions. In other words, what you heard about the crab fishery tonight, 
the, the fishermen have heard also as well through the fishermen's list serve. Sort of part clean marina program, sort of not, but I wanted to put it in there. So compliance and enforcement, the hammer, so to speak. So marine sanitation device inspections, which are required for all visiting boats and, and uh, new slip and liveaboard permit assignments. In FY15, we did 601 inspections. And you see, again, this leveling off in the last two or three years. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to credit Carl with this again. It just, and we'll find out in a couple of years once the project's over in Marina One if I'm right or not. Because if it flatlines, we'll have to come up with another guesstimate of why. But with two months of, of no transient uh, berthing and a couple of large marinas in Marina One, uh, it tends to reduce the amount of uh, MSD. You know, if it reduces the amount of transient berthing, it therefore reduces the amount of die tabbing. And we have seen a, a drop in transient berthing that's directly related to the Marina One reconstruction project. So discharge violations. How often do we cite people for, for pollution uh, in the harbor? Well, we're education heavy. We prefer to issue warnings, and, uh, but we will issue citations when we have to. Uh, last year, there were 10 known discharge violations. Seven were warnings. Three of them resulted in citations. Interestingly enough, the, the citations, two were for cigarettes, and one was for throwing a citation in the harbor. So the cigarettes, one was a guy who arrogantly flipped a cigarette into the bay, which is like, please cite me. And another person was asked not to do that, or there was a contact of some kind. I don't think they were asked not to do that. And they got upset and crumpled a whole pack of cigarettes and threw them in the bay. That says, please cite me, too. Um, so but the good news is there were no, like, major oil spills. Uh, or, or any kind of you know, marine debris deposited in the harbor that would have warranted a, a site. But that was just contacts gone bad and people getting upset and throwing stuff in the bay. So how much does all this cost? Well, here's a summary since 2003 of the cost of the Clean Marina program. And as you can see, last year's cost, uh, uh, the year before, excuse me, in FY14, was really skewed. It was up at $58,000. That was directly related to a $25,000 cleanup by Cushman Contracting, our, our quote-unquote salad boat contractors, who had to come in and basically unlock Marina One from all the debris, and spec particularly kelp, that had uh, 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 locked those boats in their slips. We didn't have that this year. So absent that, the adjusted costs, subtracting out the grant-funded aspects of this, which are also noted in your staff report. I didn't put all that in the slides, but you can see in your staff report which ones were grant-funded and which parts of the program weren't. We're right at where we're right at the average. We're right at the, you know, the 28 to 32,000 average we've had in recent years. And the good news moving forward is that next year, with the relief of $8,000 of clean water test or you know, bacterial and metals testing in the East Beach Anchorage, this may come in somewhere around $25,000, which you look at historically would be right around the lowest uh, we've had, and while maintaining a, a robust program. So in conclusion, we believe the co program continues to contribute, contribute to our overall mission with uh, annual costs remaining stable. Uh, it highlights the importance of maintaining a clean ocean environment for everybody who wants to visit here, work here, or uh, the marine animals and birds and avian life that depend on, depend on it to thrive. So we're proud of the program. We, we monitor it carefully, and we uh, look forward to moving forward with it uh, as constructed, un unless you direct us otherwise. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Crommon. Um, before we go to questions, I just, as Santa Barbarans, you know, I believe we, we hold ourselves to a very high environmental standard. And I greatly appreciate that our harbor is a, um, a beacon to the community and to the, the state, really, on environmental management. So my, my hat's off to you. and, and the entire staff, because I know it is a, it's a great team effort. So thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Any Commissioner Kramer? And I would echo that and say that the city should be really proud of the work that you guys do. It's just, it's just outstanding. I love getting this report every year. <laughs> so thank you for that, too. Sure. I, I would like to note on the team note, if you would, my colleague Carl and his maintenance staff, they're the ones that keep all this data. Teresa Lawler, our engineering tech, she's the one that goes out on the patrol boats and tests the dissolved oxygen. 
uh, Harbor Patrol, they're the ones that go out and, and patrol the waters and issue the, the, undertake the education, issue the warnings, issue the citations if they have to. And of course, my colleague, Dominique Samario, she's very much involved in the Clean Marina program, and she's also a, a huge partner in putting together PowerPoints like this. So I, I, please, that, that, that spreads to all of them. That, that, uh, thank you. Good. Any? Again, thanks to all of you, and it's just great. Commissioner McIntosh. I have a few questions. Um, I am interested in this area, as you know. Um, on the sewage pump outs, um, maybe not even an answer, just a, an observation, but I think there could almost be a study done on the number of minutes, total minutes, that sewage pump outs uh, have been used and the cycle of our economy. And you look at 03 and 04, it's close to 8,000 minutes. Um, 07, back up to 7,000 minutes. Uh, it's almost like more people are using their boats when we have downturns in the economy. Um, but that's beyond our scope here tonight. But I think it's, it's fascinating to try to figure out those numbers because it, if you just look at the numbers, it doesn't really make sense without putting some sort of analytics to it. Um, now for a question, Mr. Cronman, uh, the MSD inspections, why do, you think, why do you think there's been a continued decrease over the past 12, 13 years um, in the MSD inspections, the marine sanitation devices? It's gone from uh, 1230 in the first year that we've got data anyhow down to 601, but it's consistently dropping. One of the reasons is that um, we don't re-die tab vessels that are uh, here permanently, like commercial, like vessels that come as visitors and they stay as visitors, um, especially commercial fishermen who, if they show fish landing receipts, can stay here. Um, they don't have to get re-die tabbed. So there are a lot of moving parts to this, but the big picture question that you're answering, I really, I really actually can't answer. We have had in the last several years fewer uh, new visitors um, because of uh, the, the lack of, uh, of uh, transient berths during the Marina One construction project. And the word of that, because it's not just that chunk of the harbor, but the word of the fact, the word is out there that, that, that Santa Barbara's building in the harbor and transient berthing is tight. And what that's done is discourage you know, people from, uh, from bringing their boats up here. In fact, we're going to undertake a public outreach campaign when Carl's project is finished to recapture some of those people who, who visit Santa Barbara. But transient berthing has been down for several years in Santa Barbara. Now, other than that, I mean, if we die tab every liveaboard upon first, there, there's liveaboard, liveaboard um, uh, permits have been fairly static. Transfers have been fairly static, 50 to 60 a year. So that's that section of the die tabs. So the only really big section left are uh, the uh, transient boaters. And, tra and we have had a, a downturn in transient boating and visiting boats for some several years. That's all I can speculate okay. because we die tab every boat, live aboard, new slip assignment, and transient uh, visitor that comes okay. through. So. The numbers are accurate. The actual reasons behind it, I can only speculate, and I've offered it's, some of It's them. Carl's fault. <laughs> As I expected, it's Carl's fault. <laughs> uh, on the batteries, you know, there's the core fee that people are probably going to collect from O'Reilly or Sears or wherever they're taking their batteries. Now, do we get a fee from all state batteries or whoever it is, uh, the provider that's picking up the 180 that were turned in this year? From interstate? Interstate. Yes. No, we don't. Okay. Um, on the diving program or the hole cleaning program, how many hole cleaners do we have permitted that operate in the harbor? Mm. Dogs grub a dub for it. Yeah, I think with four or five companies, and they're obligated to be able to train their employees. So that's why we're, this repetitive training is good for them because they have employees that pass through mm -hmm. occasionally. We have four or five permitted uh, business activity permitted. Uh, dive companies in the harbor. Okay, I'm, I'm just trying to visualize how you prevent paint from sloughing off while you're scrubbing a boat vigorously underwater to get the it's, it's marine a, growth off there. How do they do that? How do they minimize the paint sure. removal? Sure. 
as Carl just said in my right ear, it starts the training, but it, <laughs> it, it physically it involves the type of brush, the way it, it goes from a very soft cloth Carl scrubbed the bottom of his own boat in Ventura Harbor, so he's an expert on this. <laughs> but it's, but it's star, it starts with a soft cloth, and you got and it, and it has to do with the type of paint. If you have an ablative paint, it comes off really easily. So it has to do with a lot of training and education, understanding what the hull is painted with, and techniques for best management practices for removing the growth without removing the paint. So that makes sense. There are a lot of yeah. different kinds of brushes and means of removing the paint without. Uh, having it slough off into the bay. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, removing the growth without having the paint slough off. Okay. Well, I just want to say this is a fantastic program. Hats off to you guys. It sounds like a full-time equivalent or two. There's so much work involved in this, and you guys are you guys are just killing it. It's great. All right. Oh, question. Commissioner Kramer. Now, I've, I have one, one specific question on the monofilament um, containers. I haven't been out to Goleta Pier recently, um, but that seemed to need these containers. Are they there? And if so, are you working with the county on it? That's a great question. Um, I'm not aware of it, but we'll, we'll reach out to county parks and see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for, for recommending that. Thanks. And I know also uh, Avila Beach has uh, just upgraded their, their fish cleaning stations for bird protection reasons. They've got new, new stations out there, and, and they also might be interested in having filament line containers. Uh, Commissioner Kramer, the word is out coastwide. I, uh, <laughs> I, would, I'd be, I would be rude to undertake the responsibility of contacting all the ports up and down the coast. But your point is well taken, but the Division of Boating Waterways is doing exactly what you're talking about. They've reached out to all of San Francisco Bay, and, and uh, they tell me they're reaching out to the entire coast. Okay. My colleague up in Morro Bay actually is, is Scott's equivalent, the harbor director up there, Eric Andersby, is already working with his sport fishing fleet to get these containers on their boats. Great. As I was yeah. next going to ask about Morrow Bay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Mr. Bamflin. Thanks. I was just going to say I'll, I'll take that upon myself to contact uh, County Parks and have them work with you. And very thorough report as always. So thank you. I appreciate it. So they'll call me. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> <laughs> I'll at least make sure they answer your call. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you again, Mr. Cromman. Um, as we move towards adjournment, uh, adjournment um, Mr. Reedman, any staff communications? Chair Spicer, nothing from staff tonight. Okay. Anything from the commissioners? Uh, all right. Um, in that case, all in favor of adjournment, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Good night. <laughs>